my name is Gordon West. I've been in Seoul for over three years now, teaching uh, at High Point. And I'll jump more into that in a little bit. Presentation. Um, I can stand, can everybody can hear me if I talk? Okay. A little louder? Okay. Good. <coughs> <coughs> uh, this is <laughs> this is this is my first Pechi Kucha. Uh, yeah. All right. So I work at the basic kindergarten high one. So that means I start my day with kindergarten, teach through every level of elementary school, and end the day at nine o'clock at night with middle school. So this means the same classroom management techniques don't work with every level. Smiley faces on the board were great for kindergarten, but not so much after eight years old. So most of the teachers at my my school to maintain sanity go into a default control mode. I did a survey and 19 of the 30 Korean and foreign teachers at my school said that they preferred lecturing to any other method of teaching. Uh, and they also reported teacher talking time of between 70 to 80 percent of the class. So this means that in a class of 40 minutes, they're at the front talking for 30 minutes of class. Uh, I've been guilty of this myself in that schedule, uh, but to the students this looks and feels like a mini dictatorship. It's ineffective not because it strips the students of their agency to learn, but because it redirects it to undermine the view. So let's leave the ESL world for a moment. Uh, James C. Scott wrote a book about peasants in rural Malaysia in the 70s. Everybody was watching Vietnam, but Scott was interested in a seemingly passive group of oppressed peasants. He discovered that they were anything but passive and noted many of their weapons of the week. Uh, some of the weapons included sabotage, theft, foot dragging, even gossip. It was never enough to provoke harsh retaliation, but it was enough to help them survive. The groundbreaking thing was that because the peasants weren't in a mass revolt, everyone assumed they were docile, but they weren't. And neither are your students. They have a number of strategies for resisting. So here are some that I've seen at my school. First, we have sabotage. Keyboards missing buttons, buttons switched around on keyboards, uh, files deleted if a careless teacher accidentally leaves his folder open, which I've done. <laughs> um, also, we have graffiti. It's another form of sabotage. Classrooms slowly fill over the air with drawings done, sometimes even while a teacher is sitting at the front lecturing to the students. Uh, CCTV in all the classrooms doesn't stop any of this. This is just one classroom at the end of last year. Uh, it can also be a form for gossip. This one written backwards tells how boring one particular class was. In this classroom, there were two notes about me on the walls. On one wall it said, I like Gordon, and on the other wall it said, Gordon is bleeping boring. So, it's a balance. Uh, disappearing homework and materials are also time-honored traditions, as are cheat sheets like this one here. Uh, and why do students use these? Well, if the test or quiz is so easy that it can be passed just by memorizing the list, then the students give it the respect that it deserves. Here are a few of my early tests whose legitimacy was challenged. Uh, I thought Diary of a Wimpy Kid was going to be a home run with my reading class, but when it wasn't, out of frustration, I tried to make quizzes to force the students to learn, and uh, this is what I get back. The best resistance was by flattery. So this is a note one first grader slipped me right before the class begged me for a game day instead of having to study that day. And when I said, okay, we'll play one game today after, after we do a little work, they slipped me the follow-up note. So this was a case of successful resistance. <coughs> um, so many teachers deal with these problems punitively, though. They separate problem students. They do collective punishment. They even yell at students. Um, usually this only creates more behavior problems, so the question is how do we get to turning around their motivation and getting them to use it for learning? So the first thing that I've tried to do is humanize my lessons. 
I try to share something about myself in each class and get to know something about my students. We need to build rapport so that we don't just become faceless categories of teacher and student. One easy way to do this is to start by replacing generic textbook pictures of families, for example, with your own family pictures. Uh, rapport is key for the next step of this process, democratizing. This is where you really put the students in the driver's seat and start to shift their motivation towards learning and less away from resisting you. Democracy is really difficult though. It needs to be guided before it can be successfully practiced and it takes a lot of time. You can't just walk into a classroom and say, so, what do you guys want to do today? It doesn't work. It takes a lot of small steps and a lot of time to learn it. I start with surveys or votes you know, on what students want to do, don't want to do, or want to talk about. I used to ask about rewards, but that was pretty redundant. Um, and then after we pick the <laughs> topics, we vote on tasks that we can do to do those topics. And I try to adopt this textbooks, or better yet, have the students evaluate textbooks and choose their own. We did this, but it failed because the administration let them choose the textbook and then changed their mind afterwards. So this led to another key part of democracy, protest, which was a great motivator for my students to want to communicate effectively in English. Uh, and of course, your syllabus is your class's constitution. Negotiating collectively brings everybody on board and uh, it makes everybody have a stake in the process. Letting students have a voice in shaping the class ultimately leads to more motivation and participation. So, does all this work in kindergarten? Maybe not. But young learners can still be empowered by voting on a <coughs> game to play that day, or even on who will be line leader, or crayon helper. And it's amazing, often the ones who act out the most in class become your best ally when their peers elect them to a leadership role. Finally, never forget your sense of humor. Successfully transitioning from dictatorship to democracy can be stressful. Building rapport helps, but you have to keep things light and maintain perspective. And often, humor is the best tool we have. Uh, and also the caricatures were drawn by my way.